The following audio may contain graphic descriptions of violence or audio clips of real-life distressing moments. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Obscura, where we shine a light on the dark. Welcome, listener. I'm glad you're here. There are places in the United States and around the globe that some believe are spiritual vortexes that attract supernatural activity. For those who believe in the paranormal, these places are ones of great power, with the ability to heal the sick and to ease troubled minds of those who visit these locations. But just as there are vortexes that attract the forces of good, those who believe these places exist also acknowledge that these are locations that attract the inverse, including the area we'll be talking about today. Buried beneath a blanket of fog that seeps into a canopy of redwood and sequoia trees sits California's Humboldt County. Often referred to as California's last coast, in the 1960s, the area became a mecca for freewheeling hippies, hoping to get out of their hustle and bustle of the big city and away from the prying eyes of law enforcement. With the hippies came the cannabis industry, and the change in laws turned the county's main export into a multi-billion dollar industry, making Humboldt County one of the nation's top distributors of cash crop. Today, Humboldt is part of what's known as the Emerald Triangle, and licensed and unlicensed cannabis growers from around the world flock to this area to produce the best medical-grade buds money can buy. Many would quickly learn that if you had a secret to hide, the place to go was Humboldt County. Perhaps that's why the world's hide-and-seek champion is rumored to have chosen the national parks of Humboldt as its home. Even before the boom of the marijuana industry, Humboldt County began making headlines in 1958, when witnesses reported encounters with a large unknown creature seen walking upright like a man, but covered in fur like an ape. The giant footprints locals began tracking would give the creature a name, Bigfoot. In 1967, The Roger Patterson tape would cement the area's reputation for being a hotbed of Bigfoot activity. The Patterson tape remains some of the best footage of this mysterious creature. However, skeptics have widely pointed out that it could just as easily have been a man in a gorilla costume. I'll let you be the judge. The migration of those looking to get back to the land was not warmly received by the local residents. Aside from the marijuana farms that began sprouting up throughout Humboldt County, the influx of new residents brought with them hard drugs, and by the 1970s, the county began seeing a rise in methamphetamine labs. Local law enforcement viewed the newcomers as a scourge to the community, and had placed the blame squarely on then-Justice of Peace, Charles Thomas, for being, quote, soft on hippies. The divide between local law enforcement and the hippies would come to an head in April of 1972. Sheriffs received word that during flyover, a clandestine methamphetamine lab was spotted on the property of a local newcomer, Dirk Dickinson. Hoping to make an example for any newcomers who thought that they were going to come to Humboldt County with the intention of manufacturing illegal substances, the sheriff called several members of the press to be on the scene as a Huey helicopter was flown over the property and police on the ground began closing in. One of these reporters that requested to be on the scene wrote in their notes, Looks like an assault on an enemy prison camp in Vietnam. Dirk and his girlfriend Judy waved to the unarmed officers in the helicopter, who they initially may have believed were part of some local spectacle, when plainclothes officers with guns unexpectedly kicked down the couple's front door moments later, Dirk panicked and leapt from his porch, sprinting into the woods. A DEA officer running behind him shot Dirk in the back, killing him instantly. The million-dollar drug lab agents that was believed to be on the property didn't exist. The only drugs found at the scene were small amounts for personal use. Dirk Dickinson would later become known as the first victim of the war on drugs. Drugs are menacing our society. They're threatening our values and undercutting our institutions. They're killing our children. 
From the beginning of our administration, we've taken strong steps to do something about this horror. 37 federal agencies are working together in a vigorous national effort. And by next year, our spending for drug law enforcement will have more than tripled from its 1981 level. With hope of a scathing Rolling Stones article written that following year, which documented the misconduct and ineptitude of local officials, as well as a newly formed and trigger-happy DEA. And nearly $250 million of their assets were seized by the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration. The federal narcotics agent who was responsible for shooting and killing Dickinson, Lloyd Clifton, would become the first narcotics agent in the agency's history to be charged with a murder. However, the case would be dismissed in 1974 after judge ruled that Dickinson's death had been the result of a justifiable homicide. This wasn't the first blood of the innocent to be spilled on the fertile soils of Humboldt County, and it certainly wouldn't be the last. In 1860, a group of settlers from the city of Eureka plotted to massacre peaceful natives who inhabited a nearby area known as the Indian Island as retribution for an ongoing disagreement over cattle. Knowing that the majority of other settlers would object to this plan, a militia group met in the dead of night with axes, clubs, and knives. As members of the Weo Nation lay sleeping, the men ambushed them. Reports say anywhere between 80 and 250 Weo people died in the massacre. Only a few survived the attack. By the 1980s, it was an open secret that Humboldt County was a prime location for cultivating marijuana, and what's referred to as the Trimigrants would come from miles around to tend the fields. Among these Trimigrants were Susan and Michael Bear. Before their arrival in Humboldt County, the Bears were prime suspects in the murder of their roommate. In March of 1981, Karen Barnes was a 22-year-old aspiring actress and had only lived with a couple for a short time before her body was discovered in the basement of the apartment building they shared. It was immediately clear that Karen had been met with foul play, having been hit in the head with a frying pan and sustaining over a dozen stab wounds. By then, the Bears had already made it to Oregon, but would return to California in 1982. Like many people who went to Humboldt County, the Bears believed that it would be the perfect place to lay low until the dust settled. Also, like many of those who came to Humboldt County, the Bears quickly found work on a marijuana farm. The employment would be short-lived when a farmhand, Clark Stevens, was shot and killed. The Bears took Clark's body and burned it in the woods. Weeks later, police would uncover his remains and identification cards. By then, the bears were already long gone, but a manifesto the couple left behind offered police a glimpse into the couple's bizarre motives behind the two murders. Titled A Cry for War, this drug-fueled stream of consciousness written by the bears detailed their unusual religion, which included radically distorted teachings of the Islamic faith, vegetarianism, and yoga. The Bears believed they had been chosen to wage a holy war against witches, abortionists, and homosexuals. The couple also detailed their plans to kill again, with a hit list that included celebrities like late-night talk show host Johnny Carson and former President Ronald Reagan. In November of 1982, police would call Michael Barron for questioning about the murder of Clark Stevens. However, police did not have enough evidence to hold him. Michael was free to go. But he forgot one thing. The handgun that was used to shoot Clark Stevens was left inside of a police cruiser. Ballistics testing would be able to tie the weapons to Clark's murder, and an all-points bulletin was sent out to officers to be on the lookout for the couple. Police would catch up to the Bears again in March of 1983. 30-year-old John Hellyar had been driving from Bakersfield to Santa Rosa when he spotted the couple hitchhiking along the highway. John stopped and offered the Bears a ride. During the drive, Susan determined that John had to be a demon because he had been playing country music. When John's legs brushed against Susan's, Michael attempted to take control of the vehicle. John managed to veer off into a shoulder of Route 101 in Los Angeles County. All three hopped out of the car, and a fight continued alongside the highway. Passing motorists watched as John struggled with Michael, who had pulled out a gun. His attempts to fend off the couple were futile, and Michael shot and killed John in broad daylight. 
Authorities were alerted by witnesses and a chase ensued. The bears were apprehended after leading officers through two counties when Susan lost control of the vehicle and crashed into a ditch. The bears agreed to confess to not only the murder of John Elyar, but also to two other murders they were suspected of committing. There was only one catch. Officers had to agree to the condition that the bears could broadcast a press conference to the local news. Evil doesn't create. Good, good is creative and evil uh, is like a, a, a parasite or a leech that does, it, it can't create, but it, it, it can only uh, copy. That's, that's why uh, powerful evil people are always attracted to, to Suzanne. During this press conference, Michael told reporters that their three known victims had lost their lives because they were witches or otherwise possessed by demons. Michael explained that Susan was a yogi and a mystic with knowledge of past, present, and future events. Kyran had been draining her of her mystic powers and had falsely claimed to have converted to the bear's religion. Stevens and Halyar, he claimed, were not only witches, but had also attempted to sexually assault Susan. Michael Bear, whose real identity would be revealed as James Carson, and Susan Bear, who was identified as Susan Barnes, were both sentenced to 75 years to life in prison for their murders. Many suspect that the couple could be responsible for as many as a dozen or more homicides, including a cold case in Ireland. To this day, the Sequoia Valley region in Alder Point and Humboldt County is known to locals as Murder Mountain after the public learned of the serial killers and their short-lived but deadly time there. It's a reputation the area would struggle to shake for years to come. In 1998, John Annabelle was charged in the murder of Debbie Sloan. Debbie had been found strangled to death in a motel room in Laytonville. Debbie, a mother of two and recent divorcee, had met Annabelle at the bar and decided to spend the night with him. After being convicted for first-degree murder in 1999... Annabelle was connected to two previously unsolved cases in Humboldt County, including the disappearance of Andrea Ladarut in 1980. Andrea and Annabelle had been living together in Fortuna when she had been reported among Humboldt County's missing. Her skull would be recovered nearly two decades later, in 2002, on the property of a Pacific Lumber Company. Another suspected victims of Annabelle's was a 19-year-old student from Humboldt State University. Annabelle had reportedly known the student, Janet Leigh Bowman, since she had been a child. Janet had last been seen at the social services office in Eureka on September 30th, 1975. Her partially clothed body would be found along the side of the highway, next to a truck scale, after the local authorities received an anonymous letter indicating that they could find her there. Annabelle has not been charged in any of the other murders he is suspected to have committed. However, it should be kept in mind that Annabelle hadn't been the only suspected serial killer roaming the dense forests of Humboldt County in the late 1990s. On November 4th, 1998, Wayne Adam Ford walked into the Humboldt County Sheriff's Office and told police there was something he wanted to confess. From his coat pocket, Ford pulled out a Ziploc bag. Inside of the bag is what officers identified as a woman's breast. The sheriff told the press that Ford was remorseful and apparently had reached a point in his life where he wanted to talk about what he'd been involved in. Ford assured sheriffs the breast in his pocket was only the tip of the iceberg. Ford admitted to the police that he had raped, murdered, mutilated, and cannibalized female sex workers and hitchhikers from several counties throughout California, including in Humboldt County, where Ford resided at the time. The torso of Ford's first victim was discovered in Eureka by duck hunters in mid-October 1997. Ford had raped, murdered, and dismembered the woman. All that is known by the police is that the woman had been a hitchhiker. The torso girl, as she is often referred to, remains unidentified. 26-year-old Tina Renee Gibbs would become Ford's second victim. Tina was described in the tearful testimony of her stepfather as a woman with a sunny personality who loved family camping trips and would often go to nursing homes to visit patients with her mother. At the age of 18, the bubbly young woman would fall into the life of partying and hard drugs. 
when her parents say she began dating a man they did not approve of. The life of excess Tina had been living drove her to the streets of Las Vegas, where Tina took up sex work. That's how she would cross paths with Wayne Ford. Ford had raped and strangled Tina Gibbs before discarding her body in a Kern County aqueduct in June of 1998. In September of the same year, Lynette White had been walking to the store to get milk for her nine-month-old baby when she would become Ford's third victim. Prosecutors believe that Lynette had been working as a sex worker when she was abducted near a Fontana truck stop. Her mother, however, told the LA Times that Lynette had recently started a new career selling interior decorating products when she vanished into thin air. A week later, her body would be recovered from an irrigation canal located in San Joaquin County. The following month, Ford would claim his fourth and final known victim. Little is known about Patricia Ann Tamez's life. She spent her last days working as a sex worker at a truck stop in Victorville when Ford picked her up for a date. Days after dumping Patricia's body in an aqueduct in San Bernardino, Ford's conscience would begin to weigh on him. He told police he began to pray a lot and decided he needed to go to the police before he struck again. It was one of Tamez's breasts that had been in Ford's pocket when he came clean about the carnage he had caused. Prosecutors were able to tie Ford to four murders he confessed to, but like the Bears, police suspect he may have been involved in many more. He is currently sitting on death row in San Quentin. The abduction of Karen Marie Mitchell was one of the alarming number of unsolved cases Humboldt County investigators have since attempted to connect Ford to. However, Ford denied anything to do with the high schooler's disappearance. Karen was last seen on November 25, 1997, at approximately 2.45 p.m., walking down the 3300 block of Broadway Street. After leaving the Bayshore Mall, where she visited the shoe store her aunt owned. Robert Durst, the eccentric Manhattan real estate heir and suspected serial killer, is also considered to be a possible suspect in her disappearance. Durst had purchased a waterfront property in the Humboldt County city of Trinidad in 1995, after learning that his father, Seymour, would be passing on the family business to his younger brother. Known around the town of Trinidad as an odd and spooky guy, Karen's aunt claimed that Durst had frequented the store she owned in the Bayshore Mall, where Karen was last seen. Investigators also reasoned to suspect Durst may have been in Humboldt County at the time of Karen's disappearance. However, they have failed to gather sufficient evidence to charge Durst with the teen's abduction. Stories like Karen Mitchell's are all too common for Humboldt County. She is one of five women who disappeared from the area who locals believe may hold a connection. In September 1993, Jennifer Wilmer, who preferred to go by her nickname, Jade, was last seen in the area of Willow Creek. There are conflicting accounts on where Jade was headed when she disappeared. Some acquaintances of Jade told police they believe she went to a travel agency in order to book a flight back to New York, while others stated they believe she was going to hitchhike to speak with someone about a job opportunity with one of the area's many farms. Jade was never seen again, but author and social media detective Billy Jensen wrote that she often attended Grateful Dead concerts. In that following year, her mother would follow the band from show to show, hoping someone could get her in contact with the man who called himself Happiness. Jade's mother believed Happiness held the key to her daughter's disappearance. No follow-up on whether her mother was ever able to get in contact with the man. Her case remains unsolved. After the disappearance of Karen Mitchell in 1997, almost a decade would pass before another woman in the area would vanish under similarly mysterious circumstances. Christine Lindsay Walters was from Wisconsin, but found herself in Humboldt County visiting with friends. On the morning of November 12, 2008, Christine was taken to an area hospital after she appeared in the doorstep of a home located in the city of Arcata. The 23-year-old was naked, confused, and covered in scratches. Christine told the residents of the home that she believed someone was chasing her, but was unable to articulate exactly what happened. It was later learned through a private detective hired by Christine's family that she had participated in an ayahuasca tea ceremony, a powerful DMT-containing hallucinogen, 
which has been known to trigger manic and depressive episodes in those predisposed to mental illness. After passing a drug test, police could not detain Christine and took her to a nearby hotel where she made arrangements with her parents to return to Wisconsin. Christine had misplaced her identification card necessary for her to fly. On November 14th, Christine's last known whereabouts had been at a copy center where her mother faxed over documents Christine needed to obtain a new identification card. Employees recall Christine acting excessively nervous while receiving the fax. Christine was never seen again, and her case also remains unsolved. In February of 2014, Humboldt County would claim two more victims. Sheila Franks stepped out for a walk from her Fontuna home and never came back. Days after police would learn that Sheila was missing, Danielle Bertoloni would also disappear from Fortuna. She was last seen climbing into the car of a man named Jimmy Jones, the living boyfriend of Sheila Franks. Danielle's skull was recovered in 2015 along the Yale River. Police questioned Jones, who admitted he was the last person to see Danielle alive. He was also the last person to see Sheila Franks alive when she set off for a walk down the home they shared. While Jones remains a person of interest in both cases, he has not been charged. In a 2016 report from Crime Watch Daily, Sheila's sister told reporters that she had no doubt that Jones was connected to Sheila's disappearance. She claimed the couple had a tumultuous relationship that sometimes erupted in violence. She was also able to offer a new connection to the missing women, collectively referred to as the Humboldt County Five. Sheila's sister claimed that Jones had been friends with Karen Mitchell, who, not unlike Sheila Franks, evaporated into the void that is Humboldt County. The missing persons case aren't only limited to women. Reporter Linda Stansberry counted at least 35 men and women who had seemingly been plucked up into the sky by some force unseen. According to the report, Humboldt County has the highest rate per capita of people missing in the state of California. The article suggests that part of the explanation for such a high rate of missing persons reports could be the county's aggressive stance on filing these reports, and often getting cases into the system as quickly as possible without waiting a full 24 hours, like many other jurisdictions. An investigative reporter for Reveal, a San Francisco-based nonprofit news organization, would unveil one of the county's closely guarded secrets that could also offer a possible explanation for the number of missing person cases. Sex Trafficking College students from Humboldt State University often find summer jobs working on the many cannabis farms scattered throughout Humboldt County, but in recent years, women have come forward to report being sexually abused and exploited by their employers. These allegations have also been confirmed by Humboldt County Sheriff Deputy O'Rourke. He told an area NBC affiliate, A lot of the trafficking that occurs in the marijuana camps are the young women who get picked up and brought up to these rural camps. And they are being forced into different sex acts, and it's now coming to our attention as law enforcement. But it's been occurring for a while. In one particularly chilling case, a 15-year-old girl was held captive by two growers after they kidnapped her from the streets of Hollywood and forced her to work in their marijuana fields. Aside from forcing the teen to perform manual labor, Reports indicate that both men had repeatedly sexually assaulted and tortured the girl. Fearing she would go to the police, the men kept her locked inside of a large metal toolbox with air holes drilled into it. When investigators were finally able to rescue her, they found a poem inside the toolbox she had written about her life. Could sex trafficking offer some explanation to why so many go missing into Humboldt County? It's difficult to say for certain. Humboldt is a county that likes keeping its secrets close to the vest. Anyone who gets too close to finding out just what those secrets are is liable to be swallowed up whole, leaving nothing behind except another face on a flyer. At least, that's what's believed to happen to Garrett Rodriguez. It's common knowledge in Northern California that anyone planning to go up to Murder Mountain is likely to return in a body bag. When Garrett, 
a San Diego native, told his friends and family that he was going to work on a marijuana ranch on the mountain, they urged him not to go. The job offered to pay more than any other job Garrett would be able to land in San Diego, and he was saving every penny he could to buy a house. Garrett would spend two years working on Murder Mountain, but was regularly in touch with his family back home in San Diego. Then, one day, the phone call stopped. After many attempts to reach Garrett to no avail, his father filed a report that his son was missing. Even knowing there was a killer in their midst, locals who lived near the mountain are reluctant to work with law enforcement. Though medical and recreational marijuana is legal in the state of California, and the ranch Garrett had been working on had been a licensed grower, cultivators remained fearful that law enforcement could take away their livelihood. After months passed and no arrests were made, a group of men from the town of Alder Point joined together to kidnap the man they believed responsible for Garrett's disappearance. The Alder Point 8, as they would come to be known, shot the suspect in the arm and leg before they forced the man to lead them to Garrett's body. The vigilante group ordered the man to confess to the murder and led investigator to Garrett's shallow grave. An autopsy determined that Garrett had been shot to death Though his family was offered some closure in receiving Garrett's body back, and the Alder Point 8 were lauded as folk heroes, the wheels of justice continued to turn slowly on the case. Since the men in the vigilante group were involved in criminal activities themselves, they refused to testify against the suspect. To date, no charges have been filed against Garrett's suspected killer. And that's this week's episode. So, what do you think? Are there negative supernatural forces that are to blame for all the death, destruction, and weirdness that seems to gravitate towards the area of Humboldt County? Or is the area a victim of their own relaxed stance on laws, combined with the corruption of some local officials and the county's ties to organized crime rings? Is it an all-consuming void, swallowing up its citizens? Or is it a self-perpetuating circle of violence? I'd love to know what you think. If you want to reach out, we're very active on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can also reach out to us on our contact form on our website, obscuracrimepodcast.com. A huge thank you goes out to those that have written reviews on their favorite podcast app. It's a great free way to support the podcast. Next week, to finish out the month of October... I think I'll read some listener reviews at the end of the episode as a way to show my gratitude. If you'd like to have your review read on the show, now's your chance. If you'd like to further support the podcast, we also have a Patreon account that offers extras such as merchandise and early ad-free access to episodes. And I think that wraps things up. Thank you again for listening. And as always, take care. Obscura, a true crime podcast is released every Wednesday. Subscribe if you'd like to continue hearing quality content.